Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Greg Wiseman, 0, 0, 1. Recognized, Brandon Vietti, 0, 0, 2. Recognized, Phil Barassa, 0, 0, 3. Initiate, Part 2. And I um, moved to California, or back to California, because I'm from Los Angeles, and went to USC. Um, for graduate school, got my master's, and uh, I'd written, uh, I had a writing partner for a while while I worked at DC, a guy named Kerry Bates, who's been a writer in the industry for a long time. You and did Captain uh, Adam together. We did Captain Adam together and, and a few other things, and we also wrote one episode of Gem and the Holograms. Mm. Oh, right. Um, that came up on the show, somebody mm -hmm. pointed that out. Yeah, and we had pitched to, on Transformers and Wildfire and a whole bunch of shows that Sunbow was doing back then because Carrie knew Roger Slifer, who was a story editor there. And uh, we only s sold the one uh, episode of uh, Gem. So, like, that was big. Like, okay, this will get me into television. Of course, it had no effect. It led to nothing, <laughs> which is sort of the story of my life. I do something thinking this is the next big step and then it leads to nothing and I have to start off. Um, Law school. Sometimes you got to break in a few times though. Yeah, I've been that breaking in. That kind of happens. I've been breaking me. in yeah. for You'll get 30 there. years now. <laughs> You'll get there, young man. <laughs> Keep participating. 35 years I've been breaking in. It's all about, um, the, it's all about your network, Craig. You got to know people. <laughs> <laughs> While I was at graduate school, I started uh, going on these interviews what I called, I'd call up, I'd cold call all these studios, right? executives at these studios saying, I, I want an informational interview. I'm not looking for a job. I've got an, and this was true. I had a contract to teach at USC and uh, I couldn't have taken a job if they had uh, offered it to me. Um, but I thought uh, I wanted to meet people and I wanted to find out what they did. So a bunch of people didn't respond at all and a bunch of people didn't have the time or take the time. Um, but unsurprisingly, there are a bunch of people in Hollywood who don't mind sitting down with you for an hour if they get to talk about themselves. Yes. Hmm. So That's what this is right here. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> I met with a bunch of different people and and, uh, and I said, what do you do? I, I just, I don't know how Hollywood works and what do you do and this kind of stuff. And I met with people in features and I met with people in live action and and I didn't meet with anyone in animation because I didn't even think of that. But I met with this guy, Gary Kreisel, who at the time was head of television at, at Walt Disney. And what he knew that I didn't know was that um, he was starting up this animation division there. Uh -huh. And um, so I could tell we kind of hit it off. So I tried to keep in touch with him. and eventually there's a lot more to this story but i've gone on long enough as it is um eventually uh he hired me as a uh, uh, in a very very junior executive capacity at walt disney television animation um which in a still longer story led eventually to me being director of series development there at which point i was developing a bunch of different shows including gargoyles and um when i developed gargoyles um I just fell in love with that show and I, you know, usually when I developed a show, I would develop it, I would find uh, someone to be the showrunner on the show and then I would just sort of nudge them out the door, so to speak, and and I would sort of pay attention through the pilot to make sure they were making the show that we had sold right. to Michael Eisner. And then I'd walk away. There were other executives who handled current programming and that wasn't my job. It was, my job was to come up with the new shows. Right. And um, but by the time we got to that point on Gargoyles, I didn't want to walk away. And also I had taken the job at Disney like, OK, this is what I'll do during the day. And then I'll go home at night at write and write. But for five years, I'd done almost no writing because the job was, you know, 60 hours a week. And I was doing a lot of writing as part of the job, but n yeah. not my own stuff. And I so I went to my bosses and I said, I, I want to produce this show. And they're like, well, you've never produced a show before. And I'm like, yeah, but I'd never been a development executive before. And that worked out all right. And so they said, well, for the first season, which was only 13 episodes, 
we want you to, you can produce the show with Frank Parr, who was the other producer on the show. Um, but you have to keep doing your development executive job. And so I did two full-time jobs and they paid me for the lesser of the two. Of course. Um, <laughs> and so we did 13 episodes on a 10 month sliding schedule. And then um, for season two, they upped the order to 50 two episodes on a 10 month sliding schedule. Whoa. And I said, I don't think I can still do two jobs while producing 52 episodes in a year. So I moved over full time to producing and, and uh, that's pretty much what led me in a very indirect route to Young Justice. Does it, the, the production part of it, did that, like you ended up there in, in Gargoyles, it, was there something about that that kind of I'm picturing in my head that you got to pr production and you were like, this is all the things that I can, that I do and that I like and that I enjoy. And I get to do this thing. So you get to, you get the writing, the creative, the storytelling aspect, but you're not just writing an episode of a show. I mean, it's very clear that you are a, as Crispin called you, a conscious creator, right? You are thinking steps ahead. You are setting things up I'm to knock them down. I'm unconscious creator too. That's fair. But, um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, well, one of the things when I started it, uh, Disney was that I realized first off that I knew nothing about animation. So in that sense, I, I, I can't draw at all, but it, it's not dissimilar to what how these guys felt when they first got into animation. What I did do right off the bat is I found some mentors, Gary Kreisel on the business side, Tad right. Stones on the development side, and Alan Zasloff on the production side. And I studied with these three guys um, and really learned everything I could about how to make an animated show short of being able to draw something right. myself. Well, that, that actually segues pretty nicely into the next thing, unless you had something else to wrap up. Um, well, just the, the one thing about making Gargoyle specifically, and one of the reasons that I, I so wanted to do it is that, and a lot of it is thanks to Batman the Animated Series. I mean, I was an adult when that came out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but <laughs> was that it, it freed us up to do a show like Gargoyles. But Gargoyles isn't very much like Batman. No. Just um, showed that there was an audience for more sophisticated right. exactly. storytelling. Um, right. And the thing about Gargoyles was the tapestry, the arc. And so the thing that for Frank and I, when we were making that show, very consciously, is that we were setting out to make a show that we wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. And that's been sort of my guiding light ever since, which is that I can't guess or anticipate what the audience Yep. may or may not like yes yes but what i can do is be passionate about doing what i want yes. and then i cross my fingers that the passion shines through and that the audience then responds to it or at least an, a high enough quantity of audience responds to it that yeah. it succeeds and that's largely been true but what that meant for me is that i grew up on comic books which had continuing storylines i literally also watched soap operas like all my children and one life to live I was a huge fan of Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues oh, yeah. was a major influence yeah. on everything I've done. And one of the things that Hill Street Blues did from the second season on was every episode had at least one story with a beginning, middle, and end on it. But it also had these threads that ran through and arced right. through an entire season and some threads that didn't just arc through a season but arced through mm -hmm. the series as a whole. Hill Street and Blues, that became the model. People missed that. Hill Street Blues rocked. Hill Street Blues yeah. is the foundation of all modern television. Right. Mm. I mean, literally, it, you, it you don't everything. have Game of Thrones without Hill Street Blues. You don't have any show that you binge. Yep. As opposed to something that's just purely episodic. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Hill Street Blues changed everything about television. Even a show like Cheers yep. is heavily influenced by what Hill Street Blues did. The first season of Cheers came out a year after Hill Street Blues. And the Sam and Diane romance even would not have existed as it did in any show that came out before Hill Street Blues right. because that serialization of elements of the show, despite the fact that each episode of Cheers is purely episodic, yeah. mm -hmm. that ongoing arcing of those characters, that did not exist in television other than daytime soap operas right. before mm. Hill Street Blues. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's well let's talk let's dive into this because this this whole last thing that you've been talking about goes into what I want to talk about because I've got all three of you in the room, right? So I want to talk about the creative process, just like you're talking about about how Young Justice came about from the pitch on, but I also want to talk about 
what it takes. Like when we got the announcement that there was going to be a season three, you weren't even hired, Greg, because you and I had an interview set up and you signed your contract the day before we were going to do our interview and then you were on lockdown for the next season. So we usually when you get an animation, uh, animated series announced, it's usually they've already got animation going. There's like a trailer. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes mm-hmm. on. In this case, you got an, we got an announcement that it was greenlit, mm-hmm. which was blew my mind. My phone blew up and everything blew up. Mm. Uh, people telling me what was going on, right? But I want to talk about the how the creation process happens, how Phil gets involved. Like we we get to hear a little bit from you guys as store as the showrunners. But like, there's so much to it. Like we're talking about, it's not a comic. You don't yeah. have four or five people. Like I can talk to Chris, Christopher Jones all day long about comic creation stuff. But what you're talking about here is, like you're saying, animation. Like Brandon was saying, animation is overseas. You storyboard here. You do all the production over here. But it's literally not even in the same pre-production. Excuse me, pre-production here, and then just everything gets sent someplace else, mm-hmm. and you're not even in the same building or even in the same city yeah. in many cases. So or continent. Or con it, right. <laughs> so how did how did you guys, Greg and Brandon, how did you guys come together to do the development on Young Justice? Had you worked on something about before? season one? Season one, yes. Uh, Brandon, talk about season three, well, really, but... I was already here. He was here. Yeah, and I'd been, I'd been here for a while, like, trying to get something off the ground. I had started producing a project and got really far down the road in its development, and the plug got pulled, like way into it after scripts were written boards were done and and can we, can we know what that is or no <laughs> it's okay it was, it was a huh? it's cloud ninja <laughs> it was not cloud ninjas it was, <laughs> but so like after that went away that, that was the first thing i developed but uh you know i i guess i did a good job the executives at, at warner brothers kind of kept trying to give me did a work good job and the thing that got plugged yeah up, plug it, up old. Yeah. yeah it was uh, i mean that's actually a big part of what right. we do though like a lot of times when you're pitching you're if you're going with something that's an original concept even right. if it's from the library it's not necessarily even if they love it if it's not part of the plan the like you know what there's a got, bigger picture going on yeah, yeah. if it, they they they'll just see you as somebody with the potential to develop something so you know i could go to them with an adam strange pitch let's just say right and, yeah, and let's if do i that. put together a great you know presentation okay. That doesn't mean that they are suddenly going to switch gears and be like, "Now we're making an Adam Strange cartoon because yeah, yeah, yeah. Phil wants to make one." But what they what what will happen, and, and in Brandon's case, what did happen is they recognize you as someone who can develop something. Right, right. So that, Every, everything's a part of the resume, right? Yeah, so yeah. keep participating. Yeah. Stuff that doesn't ever exist yeah. in you know right, real time. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then uh, Sam Register came into the studio at, at some point within those years of me trying to get something going, and he kept working at it, and he really. Um, helped me find some traction and ultimately after you know directing the under the red hood movie around the time that was finishing um the movie I was so good dude thank you <laughs> i mean it was a great script by judd winnick and and you know it was great to work with bruce tim on that it was a big group effort to just make that, that was movie. our first elseworlds deep dive for the dc animated stuff because we were like yeah we're all doing that's that's <laughs> that's cool first yeah it was um, amazing so it was like as a, that project was winding down sam sat me down to try to develop a, a series and at that point said, how do you feel about Greg Wiseman? <laughs> Didn't ask you about DC comic sidekicks. They asked you about Greg. Yeah. That's... And so, um, and I, you know, Greg and I had kind of like worked off and on over the years on the same projects. Like we, we never got to be like in the room together and develop a story and stuff, but I would get his scripts as a director right. and they were always my favorites. They're very thorough, very well thought out. And Greg has something um, not every writer has, and that is like a great director brain. So I think he visualizes things mm-hmm. very well, and he gets that in a script very well. Nice. So I was very excited to team up with Greg. Does it make it easier or harder when someone... My guess is it makes it easier, but I, I'm just that's an assumption in my part, to direct something where someone has that director brain. Does it help that they can kind of know how to communicate a scene or an oh, idea? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it helps the storyboard artists and the directors, uh, you know, understand what the needs of the story are when, when right. it's it's kind of built into the structure of the script. Some of the visuals kind of being there helps explain the story point, helps the artists visualize the written word on the page better. Right. Um, and that's really important if, if, as a writer, you're trying to get something very specific on screen. It's, it's really 
a great tool to be able to communicate with yeah. the artists in, in kind of a language that makes sense to them. It's funny. I remember there's a, there's a few episodes in particular, but there was definitely, it was like an episode of Buffy or something I was watching. And I didn't understand that it was a Halloween episode. There's a bunch of pumpkins on a front stoop of a house. And one of the characters walks up and says, pumpkins, very dangerous. You go first. In this real like flat tone. And I was like, oh, it was an Indiana Jones joke. And they didn't know how to direct it. <laughs> he was supposed to be Sala, pumpkins, very dangerous. You go first. Right. But it was like, what did I just see? So there was some disconnect between whatever wrote. I was like, that looked good on paper. That would have mm -hmm. been really funny. Somebody didn't understand what it was and couldn't get it on the screen. Really easy to fail. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, and it, it doesn't happen that blatantly that often, um, but it was just like this scene, none of this makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, somebody missed. Right. And so that's what I'm wondering. That's what I was wondering if it makes it easier if somebody, you guys are on the same wavelength. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 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 And then there's less iterations trying to get it right. Yeah. So yeah. you, because we have very tight timetables to make animation. Um, right. You don't have time to do lots and lots of iterations and changes and ex explorations. Like, right. you know, one or two chances Reshoots, and then you're quote, locked unquote. you're done. Yeah, yeah. You know? Right. So they, so he's approached you and he said, w what do you think about Greg Weissman? You told him we have to fight first, then we'll be allies. <laughs> um, but you, you obviously liked his stuff already. But yeah. does that mean, Greg, you had come to them with a pitch for this? No. Um, oh. I was finishing up Spectacular Spider-Man. Which also Brandon, a um, fantastic show. Thank you so much pitched, for that. Didn't you pitch designs on that show at one point early on? They, Yeah, they had actually asked me to kind of kick in some designs, but they weren't very good. <laughs> so I didn't get that job. <laughs> um, and we were had been hoping for a third season on that show. And then um, Disney bought Marvel and, Fired and Sony <laughs> gave Marvel the animation rights back for concessions on the live action side of things oh. which created a sort of weird legal impossibility in other words marvel couldn't do a third season of spectacular spider-man without paying sony to do it because sony owned that version of the show and sony couldn't continue to do spectacular spider-man because they'd given marvel the animation rights so even though we were actually a huge hit, oh man, we couldn't get pickup for a third season because of these legal problems. So I was not quite done with post production, but was virtually or on the verge of being unemployed. And I got a call from Sam, who I'd met uh, back when he was at Cartoon Network doing Ben Ten, uh, which I'd written a couple of or four or five freelance episodes of, and. He brought me in, and I remember, you know, the first day he's like, "Good team you up with Brandon Vietti," and I knew Brandon. Um, we, I feel like I mostly knew you from like voice recording sessions for episodes of The Batman, like uh, artifacts and stuff mm -hmm. like that, where you directed episodes that I uh, mm -hmm. had written. Mm -hmm. And the producers of The Batman were always really cool about letting the writers come to the voice recording sessions. They don't have anything to do there, honestly, yeah. but they're fun. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So I always invite the writers to our voice recordings. Oh, know, that's nice. Not all the writers to every session, but the whoever wrote that episode, we invite to the session because I feel like it's a perk. And I didn't meet Phil that day, but at least back then, designs for various projects were on the wall. So Sam walked me down. I think it was stuff you'd done for... Probably crisis. crisis, yeah. He said, and this is who we're going to have designed. So we didn't meet that day, but the th he basically said, these are the three people I want on this show. So they had the idea for the show or you pitched the idea? No, this is the I confusion. did not pitch the idea for this show. Okay, okay. Quite the reverse. Sam sat, sat us down. So that was the first day. The second day, Sam sat, I don't, these days weren't consecutive, but the next yeah. time I came in, Sam sat the two of us down and said, want to put you on Young Justice. And he had the title from the the Todd Knock, Peter David comic. comic. He's right. like, and you don't have to adapt that. Do what, you know. And we were like, no. Well, at first it was Justice League. And we were like, no. Because oh, yeah, it, 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 it had, you know, uh, Bruce Timm's Justice League had kind of just ended. Um, and it was like, no way did we want to follow no. so closely in those yeah. amazing <laughs> footsteps that would travel before us. No with those pressure. Characters. Yeah. Right, exactly. So I think I, I, that's where it's fuzzy to me. Like, I can't remember, like, where the Young Justice part f uh, folded in 
well, after I do remember we were the shy whole, about Justice yeah, League. There was, he still pitched us the title Young Justice. Mm. And we still said no because, you know, Teen Titans had just ended. Justice League Unlimited had just ended. Right. And, we, and Teen Titans was, and those are two very different style shows. Right. And we felt like, but they were both very successful in their own right and, and high quality. And we felt like there's no room for us. Yeah. And then I think a couple things happened, which I can take no credit for. So I'm happy to like uh, push it, which is one, we started focusing on Phil's designs and his more uh, realistic style than either obviously Teen Titans or the Bruce Tim style right, that had right. been in, in Unlimited. And then he came up with this idea, which was this, the covert ops thing. That was stuff I'd, I'd been interested in. I'd been playing a lot of like first person shooter yeah. video games, like, you know, Splinter, Splinter Cell. Cell. And, yeah, that's exactly what yeah. popped into my head. And yeah. I mean, even honestly, from where we started this conversation, going back to stuff like G.I. Joe, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That I was going to say, just... low key, Brandon's always just wanted to make a G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I was a big fan of um, the Ghost in the Shell movie yeah. and series. And, me too. Yeah, he that showed, he played huge that for me. That was one of the first, we sat down, had lunch. Yeah. One of the first things he did was, Play the gave you a DVD or something. That's the dragon I've always been chasing. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, to have the the chance to kind of do a, a DC universe, you know, version of that, we found very helpful in changing up the the vibe of our show from you know right. Justice League Unlimited and and from Teen Titans. Right. And you know, with with Phil's the realism that Phil's designs were bringing to it, you know, we we quickly kind of came together on this idea that. Uh, we weren't going to make a superhero show like Justice League Unlimited or a superhero show like Teen Titans. We just weren't going to make a superhero show. Like we were going to first right. make a show about teenagers that are spies. And by the way, third, they happen yeah, to be yeah, superheroes. Yeah, so, that, you know, we had like a clear order of importance into how we were going to layer the stories and texture the stories. And hopefully that would be enough to separate us from the great shows that came before us. And, and we wanted to... I mean, not just like separate, but give the fans something new and different. And I think something different than we had ever worked on yeah. before as well. Yeah. Uh, so it seemed like, you know, new territory for us to explore and evolve. And then we sort of got the marching orders that, you know, in other words, when I did Spectacular Spider-Man, it was like Spider-Man corner of the Marvel Universe. But we couldn't do Fantastic mm. Four characters. We couldn't, They're you know, all I, sectioned I, off you know it was all... Yeah. Yeah. And we actually got the marching orders that we weren't doing a Teen Titans show about five characters. Yeah. We were doing a DC Universe and show. Part of the wow. Is, and so there was this sort of push to let's rebrand it with a new look. Right. And uh, we'll just, you know, piggyback the whole DCU into this Young Justice universe under this like Young Justice banner. Right. That's you know ostensibly about these this core group of kids, but we're gonna then have the it branch out into the whole DCU. You guys talking about the fact that this is now a whole DC universe show? I was gonna say the the almost the irony here is we talked to a lot of fans who were like, uh, uh, we want a Justice League show that's Young Justice's version of the Justice League. And when I talked to people and pitched the show to them about like, oh, it's about the sidekicks, and I'm like, yes. Also, it's about the entire literal DC galaxy, yeah. right? I mean, we haven't even touched the Hawks. I mean, that your Hawkman, Hawkwoman mm. designs are just, they kill me every mm. time. I Love want them. to see what you guys want to do, how you guys are going to fix, it would be quote fun unquote, to the Hawks origin. It would, we, we've all, as much as I complain, which these guys know I complain all the time. Yeah, I can tell. This show is really hard. Yeah. But I think what we all feel is that we've created this universe that has all this texture yeah. and all this diversity. Right. And, and you could just, so much story potential in right. every pocket. Well, we talk about it all the time. Like every character you guys have, somehow you guys have mastered an ensemble cast from design to writing to directing to the story arcs through the meta plots on multiple seasons. Right. 
you, you've you've mastered this thing so that every character feels alive, mm-hmm. rich, and they developed. Have a before the fact that we walk into even the first episode, and Wally knows Dick, and Dick has a history, and they have a history, but they don't really know Calder that well. Like they know of him, but they haven't worked together. But they all had this history, and every moment, every scene that you see them in, you you feel like you've been dropped in in media res into a living world. Well, and, and every that was, step beyond that was that. part of the goal. I mean, um, again, I'm a big fan of Teen Titans, but one of the things that's very different about the two shows is that Teen Titans opens with five kids with no backstories, mm. right, right? No family uh, until you know Starfire's sister shows up right. at some yeah. point, right. you know, right. um, yeah, yeah. and they just live in Titans Tower and eat pizza, and and then it all takes off from there, and it's all good stuff. But we didn't want to do that. Um, in part, one of the reasons we didn't want to do it is because they'd already done it. Right. But in, in other part, I think for both of us and our sensibilities had to do with, no, we want these characters to have history and we want them to have futures and we want them to have interrelationships and dynamics, not just between the handful of leads, but between all these other characters. We thought long and hard about who was in the Justice League at the beginning of season one. We really, I specifically, uh, not that these two disagreed with me, but I specifically really wanted this moment, which you see at the end of uh, episode two, end of our pilot, which is the Justice League coming, coming down, down like the, the gods sky. down from Olympus. Um, I, so very consciously, it's like, okay, who's going to be our Green Lantern? Is it going to be Hal or John? No, both. Captain Adam, Captain Marvel. I wanted heavy hitters in there. We left out some traditional leaguers like the Adam and stuff because in that moment, they didn't bring that sense of mm. of the gods oh, coming down. Yeah. But we wanted both Hawks on the team. We wanted both Lanterns on the team. Right. We wanted both Captains on the team. We wanted Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman. And we wanted to fill this out so that the league was this Olympian pantheon that these kids could aspire to, and and also, and, and also like actually rebel against, right, right, um, because that that was very much a part of yeah. uh, the growing up process that we wanted to take these characters through. Is like look at they are the quote unquote sidekicks of of this group of mythic, legendary characters, mm-hmm. and now they're going to say we don't. Want yeah. to be part of this, right. we want our own thing, yeah. and they have to stand up to that. Well, here's something. Here's something that I need to talk about too: is this idea when you're developing a show like this, right? I mean, the goal is generally, oh, it's teenagers; they're learning how to be an adult or learning to be themselves as adult, take agency in their own lives, and how are they going to be adults? Different than the Justice League, right? There's a whole other aspect to this which we haven't discussed at all, and we probably don't have time today, but we should get to it some later date, which is that. Developing a show and selling a show are two entirely different things. Right. And I guess that's part of like leading in what I'm what I'm saying. Like you guys had this idea of this long form storytelling. We're talking about Robotech earlier, right? You're talking about Ghost in the Machine. You're talking about these influences that you guys had when you're developing the show. Normally when you watch a show, the first time I saw Superboy, I was like, Oh, I got angsty strength guy for the next five seasons. Mm-hmm. Oof. I don't know if I let's see how this goes, right? Of course, by episode three or four, if by, I knew we get five seasons just by keeping him an angsty strength guy, I might have done that. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. By schooled, that was the episode. My wife's a teacher, and so when I got her to watch the show, it was schooled. The episode of schooled right at the beginning, when Superboy is, I want to be a hero. I'm a hero or a weapon. Here are my choices. I'm trying to be a hero. Superman literally flies off and leaves me, so I guess I'm going to be a weapon. And then Black Canary, you know, throws me onto the ground. And no, right. Yeah. And so she's, my wife looked at me and she's like, this is not what I was expecting. This show mm. is not what I was expecting. And then you get through this thing. Usually my thought process behind developing something like this is once you make angsty, angsty, handsome strength guy, you don't want to change handsome, angsty strength guy because people will like him and you want to sell him for five seasons. Right. But you didn't. You do what other shows don't do, which is develop character arcs into a place where now we get Superboy Telling, telling Blue Beetle in season two, freshmen never do the homework. And being a leader of people and, and, a, and a guide, this is something that we've never seen before in these things. This decision you guys made early on and decided this is what you wanted to do, right? 
how did that come into play? And did you ever question that? Or was it like, nope, this is what we're going to do? I think that was part of the growing up process. I mean, in, in really thinking through young justice and telling the stories of young characters, we knew we were going to be growing these characters and, and watching them grow on screen. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely remember that with uh, Connor. I remember even people on the, the crew like really questioning, you're making him unlikable. Why would you do that? And it's like, well, we had a plan. We were gonna. Right. We started him in this place that may not be the I'm most likable. I'm trying guy. to think if I liked him. I probably <laughs> I did didn't not like him. Was... I just was like, oh, this is who I'm getting. I question. This won't change. I question right? every choice we make. Right. Right. Constantly. Fair enough. <laughs> but that was that was part of the plan was to, to grow these characters, and you know, where they start isn't necessarily where they're they're going to end up. And there's there's surprise in that. It makes the series a little less predictable. Once you know that can happen with one character, you don't know what's going to happen with the rest of the characters. Right. We like and, that and sense again, of surprise. The whole uh, secrets and lies thing is huge in this show. And so it's right. part of how we chose the cast. I mean, that was a whole, our, how we chose our leads was a whole process in and of itself. Well, we should talk about that next time as well. Unfortunately, mm. we're running out of time, so we're going to have to wrap up a little bit. Huge thanks to Greg, Brandon, and Phil for joining us, and to Warner Animation for arranging this discussion. You can find Greg on Twitter at Greg underscore Weisman, Brandon at Brandon Vietti, and Phil Barassa at Phil underscore Barassa. You can now also find seasons one and two of Young Justice on the DC Universe subscription service. And thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com, our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com, and now on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And even though Season 3 is on its way. Please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay, stay wild, wild, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well